Our teaching tonight is going to be from John 11. We're going to cover several verses. We're not going to address every detail in every verse. But as we move through, I want you to keep in mind a quote that Jesus is going to say. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Sort of our focus tonight is that idea. Before we dive in the text, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now to study your word together. Lord, we lift up Albert and Cynthia. And Lord, we lift up Jackie and Junior and Arabella. And we just pray your hand of healing on them, your hand of blessing and protection and comfort. Lord, we pray that you'll heal them quickly. Bring them back to full health so they can resume their normal activities. And we, Lord, we pray your blessing over this time, that you would speak to us through your word, you would set aside all the distractions, and that you would speak to each one of our hearts the message you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to start verse 1, John 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. John chapter 11 is a historical narrative, and all that means, narrative means it's a story. Historical means it's real. So this is a real-life story that John's telling. And I say that because these verses introduce our main characters. We've got Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Jesus. And these four people are going to be central to, to most of the scenes that we look at tonight. We're going to ha have three different scenes, and they're based on where Jesus was. The first scene, where we start, Jesus beyond the Jordan. The second scene is... Jesus arrives in Bethany, and the third scene will be Jesus at Lazarus' tomb. These first four verses serve as an introduction. We already mentioned the main characters. Who are they? Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Jesus. What's going on? Lazarus is deathly ill. Where are they? Well, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are in Bethany, but Jesus isn't with them. Jesus is across the Jordan. Now, I don't have a map, so if you can picture... You know, in, just in the middle of the screen right there is Jerusalem. Bethany is very, very close, and the Jordan would be like the edge of the screen. So Jesus is just off the edge of the screen. So he's just a little ways away. And so what happens? Lazarus gets sick. They send a messenger to him. Why is Jesus so far away? Well, he's across the Jordan because back in chapter 10, that's the narrative where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the gate of the sheep. Well, the Jewish leaders realized he's claiming to be the Christ, which is the Son of God, which is the claim of deity. And the Jewish leaders, of course, didn't believe that he was the Christ, and so they were trying to stone him. And so Jesus is a little ways away. That sets the stage for what's going on. It's important to point out here, the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. They're appealing to his affection for Lazarus. It's thought by most interpreters that John, uh, Jesus was very good friends with the whole family, Martha, Mary, and, and Lazarus. And so he would stay there on occasion when he was traveling through town. Or when he was staying in Jerusalem, he would actually stay at Bethany because it's so close. It's only two miles away. And so they appeal he, to him, he whom you love is sick. He's, he's like a very good friend. That brings us to verse 4. When Jesus heard that he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Here, John narrates the purpose of Lazarus' sickness. Clearly, Jesus has intentions to use Lazarus' illness to demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, John emphasizes Jesus' love once again 
for the family. Where, where before, Mary and Martha appealed to Jesus' brotherly love, here, John emphasizes his divine love, Jesus' divine love for Lazarus, his agape, his perfect love. Here's the thing. Jesus heard the news that Lazarus was sick, and what did he do? He stayed there for two days. That just blew my mind. Why would you stay for two days when you can go and help somebody that you care about so much? Part of the reason I chose John 11 is that I've been studying it in one of my classes for most of the year. And I've been wrestling with that question for most of the year. Why would Jesus do this? Of course, I know the purpose. It just boggles my mind. It seems unkind and unloving, at least from a human perspective. But we've got to remember, God has a bigger plan. And more often than not, he works in ways that we do not expect. Just a week ago, I was talking with one of my classmates. It was about a theological issue. I don't remember what it was about. But he says to me, you know, I think you're wrestling with this because it doesn't fit inside Tim's little box. I had to reflect on that a lot. I didn't like it when he said that. But I thought about it for a couple of days. I was like, you know what, you're right. It didn't fit in my box. My point is, Mary and Martha sent to Jesus because they wanted him to come quickly and heal their brother who was sick. But Jesus did not meet those expectations. He wasn't going to fit inside their box because there's a bigger plan. And the plan that we're going to see unfold is he wasn't going to heal a man who was sick. He was going to raise a man who was dead back to life. So far, John has led us to sympathize with the sisters. But now he shakes our expectations. Jesus' divine purposes are so much greater than what we could have expected. John has already said Jesus' purpose was the glory of the Father, and that through that the glory of the Son would be revealed. Soon we're going to read how that's going to happen. That brings us to verse 7. After this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Jesus says, let's go to Judea. And the disciples are thinking, this is the place that the Jewish leaders just tried to stone you. And you want to go back there? And so they say that. And Jesus gives kind of a cryptic response. He doesn't, he doesn't give a purpose. He talks about there being 12 hours in a day, walking in the light, walking and not stumbling. I had to reflect on this a little bit. The disciples are confused about what's going on. They don't really understand the urgency. See, Jesus waited two days. So if I'm with Jesus, ministering with Jesus, and he waits two days, then it must not be that urgent. So why do we need to go back to Judea right now? Jesus doesn't immediately correct him. Instead, he sets their mind on spiritual things. In John 9, and I've got the verse up here, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. And he said to the disciples just before he did that, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. And that sort of echoes what Jesus just said to his disciples in John 11. What Jesus is saying is, I have a ministry here on earth. It's a preordained plan, and certain things have to happen. Instead of worrying about the, the Jewish leaders who were trying to stone me, I need you to minister with me. I need you to follow me. I have a purpose here. As long as my ministry isn't finished, nothing's going to happen to you as long as you're with me. Because I have to finish my ministry. So that's what Jesus is talking about here. 
walking in the light of the world is walking with Jesus, going with Jesus to Bethany. He's inviting them to come with him and to see what's going to happen. In John 11, verse 11, These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. So it's even more clear the disciples didn't understand what was going on. Well, he's just sick. We waited around. You know, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. Why do, why do you have to go and wake him up? He's just going to get better and wake up on his own. But Jesus wasn't talking about physical sleep. He was talking about, he was, it was a euphemism. In first century Judaism, sleep was a, a nice way of saying that uh, a person was deceased. And so they were confused because Jesus was speaking in this euphemism instead of speaking in, in, a, in a plain way. Maybe you've heard the saying, hindsight is twenty twenty. When I look back at past events in my life, I can clearly see how God was working in those events. But when I'm in the midst of something, then it's really difficult to discern what's going on. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of misunderstanding. When I look at these verses, that's what I'm seeing going on with the disciples. They're not getting the big picture. Jesus hasn't fully revealed the big picture yet to them. But he's saying, I need you to come with me because I need you to see what's going to happen. Personal example. When I graduated from high school, I went to college as an engineering major. Eventually, I realized that wasn't a good fit. I wasn't quite sure where I did fit, except that I really had this knack for math and a knack for teaching, so I pursued a degree in education, and I ended up teaching high school math for a few years. At that same time, I was pretty active in the church I attended while I was in college, and I led worship on Sunday mornings and some weekly small group studies. I didn't know then that the Lord might be preparing me for ministry. I never would have guessed I would have moved to California last year and Arizona this year. And I don't know where we're going to move in a year and a half, probably back to California. And then after that, who knows? So even right now, there's a lot that I don't know. I just know that something's happening. And I also know that sometimes, even right now, I'm not getting a lot of it. But I know that one day I'll be able to look back and pinpoint God was orchestrating those events to bring me to a certain place. For a certain event. In John eleven fourteen, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now he's talking plain. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Jesus is finally talking plain to them. No more euphemisms. Lazarus is dead. But then he says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? Here's a purpose statement. That you may believe. This is our second purpose statement. The first was that the Son may be glorified. A little vague, but it's to God's glory. The second, what is that glory? That you may believe. We're going to come to what that means. Believe in what or in who in a few verses. It's interesting what Thomas says. I like Thomas. He's a bold guy. He speaks his mind. But he's also clearly still not getting it. He says, let us go also that we may die with him. He doesn't get that they're not going to their death. They're going to witness something very special. And that he's going to be okay because... Jesus' ministry isn't finished, like we just talked about the idea of the light of the world. But he does get, and he's bold enough to say, you know what, let's go with Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow him to our deaths, but let's follow him. 
I know that's a boldness. Some of us are bold, some of us aren't. I'm not a very bold person. So that's a boldness that I can learn from. That ends the first scene. That brings us to the second scene. Jesus arrives in Bethany. So in verse 17, So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. The scene has changed. Jesus has now arrived in Bethany. Lazarus has now been dead for four days in the tomb. A few, not a lot, but a few interpreters believe that Lazarus somehow recovered by laying in the tomb. But only a few believe that because it's just plain silly. According to Jewish tradition, Lazarus would have been pronounced dead. He would have been wrapped head to foot. And now he's been laying in the tomb for four days without food and water in a tomb covered with a stone. It's abundantly clear that Lazarus was deceased. So why did Jesus wait two days to come to Bethany? Well, I can't answer that question fully, but I do know part of it is we need to make sure Lazarus was really dead because Jesus didn't come to heal a sick man. He came to raise a dead man. According to ancient Jew Jewish burial practices, Lazarus was almost certainly prepared for burial and laid in the tomb on the same day he was pronounced dead. During the first seven days, remember we're on, we're on the fourth day, so we're in the middle of that first week, the family mourned either at home or at the tomb. And during this time, friends and family came to honor the deceased and comfort the immediate family. So in verse 19, it says many of the Jews joined the women around Martha and Mary. Well, these are probably friends and family or friends of the deceased, and they were coming to honor the deceased and to comfort the family. The fact that Bethany was so near Jerusalem means that a lot of these Jews were from Jerusalem. Two miles is a very short distance to walk. John describes the distance between Jerusalem and Bethany for a reason. Back in chapter 10, as we've already mentioned, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem tried to stone Jesus because he claimed to be the Son of God. They didn't agree with that, so they thought he was blasphemy, and the penalty is stoning. Now in chapter 11, Jesus has returned within two miles of where that happened. And so there's this, this sense, there's this tension building of this sort of danger. Right now, it's far off. We're at Bethany. We're not in Jerusalem. But the idea is, there is a danger here. And then I'm going to let you in on a, a detail about John's gospel, is that the first 11 chapters cover the ministry of Jesus. And then 11 and 12, we move into the passion narrative. So what John's doing is he's wrapping up that ministry of Jesus with this last sign. And then we're going to move into the passion. He's foreshadowing. He's using that danger, that tension to foreshadow the passion narrative. Also in verse, is it 20? Yeah, in verse 20, I want you to notice how when Martha heard that Jesus arrived, she immediately went out to meet him. He's a very close friend of hers. And she sent to him in desperation earlier. Now when he arrives, she doesn't wait for him to come to her. She goes to him. It's a time of need. And she goes to her Lord. That brings us to verse 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, 
I know that he will arise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha went out to Jesus, her friend and her Lord. And the first thing she says is, Lord, if you'd only been here. One of the classes I'm taking is Greek. And there are some things that when you study Greek, it can bring some additional elements out of the text. When she says, Lord, if you'd been here. It's as though she's saying, Lord, if you'd only been here, but you weren't. There's definitely a hint of remorse, of disappointment in her voice. She had expected Jesus to come and heal her brother, but Jesus had let her down. He was now four days late. Now, that doesn't shake her faith, but it did shake her expectations. And so she's disappointed. You know, when tragedies happen, we have choices. Specifically, we can either do as Job's wife recommended, which is curse God and die, or we can fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Now, I'm not saying that's easy to do. Absolutely not. When tragedy strikes, it is incredibly difficult to trust in Christ. Still, I think we have a choice. And our decision in that moment determines whether we are able to see the glory of the sun when we come out of those circumstances. Here, Martha chose Christ. She's going to see the glory of the sun when the miracle is performed. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. This is now the second time Jesus has plainly said what's about to ha happen. Remember previously, he said, Lazarus is asleep, I'm going to wake him up. Of course, he was saying, Lazarus is dead, I'm going to raise him. This time, he says, your brother will rise again. Second time, he said, this is what I'm going to do, but Martha doesn't get it this time. Her reply demonstrates excellent theology. Uh, first century Judaism at that time was expectantly awaiting their Messiah. Not only did they know he'd come, but they knew many things about him, and they, they were wanting him to come and, you know, save them from Rome. So her response says, I know you're the Messiah, and I know that the resurrection will happen at the last day. But she didn't quite get it that Jesus was saying, he wasn't talking about the last day. He wasn't talking about the new heavens and the new earth. He's saying, this day, I'm going to raise your brother. In verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. In the Gospel of John, I've already mentioned how th there are two main sections. There's the ministry of Jesus, chapters 1 through 11, and then there's the passion narrative. That takes us to basically 12 to the end. In the first 11 chapters, there are a total of seven signs. And there are also a total of seven different I am statements. One of the neat things about chapter 11 is it has both of those rolled into one. It has the sign of the resurrection, and then it also has Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. When Jesus claims to be the resurrection and the life, he's identifying himself as the Son. So those Jews who tried to stone him because he claimed to be the Son of God, they were right on account of what he said, they were just wrong because he really is the Son of God, so he wasn't blaspheming. So Jesus says, I am the resurrection and alive, which takes us back to something he said in John chapter 5, and I have that verse up on the screen. Verses 24 and 25, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, 
and those who hear will live. Death is an unfortunate but natural byproduct of the human condition, condition because it is the consequences of sin. Clearly Christ has not yet returned, and many believers have died physically. So when Jesus is saying, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live, he's alluding to the fact that believers have died, and many believers may continue to die, and yet they have eternal life. Further, when Christ returns, we will have new bodies. In claiming to be the resurrection and the life, Jesus claims to be the Christ, the Son of God. Those resurrected bodies will have life, new life, a fullness of life without sin, without corruption. That life comes from Jesus Christ. When Jesus finished saying that, he asked Martha, do you believe this? She said to him, we're still in verse 27, she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now the question is, did she believe before this or not? I think here Jesus is saying, will you reaffirm your faith in me? I believe that once a person entrusts their destiny to Jesus Christ, that person has eternal life and cannot lose it. And I know that's a debated issue, and I'm not going to get into that. But my point is, you're saved, but then throughout our lives we have opportunities to reaffirm that faith. Some people would call it maybe a rededication of their life. In those moments, they, those moments have the potential to bring us cl into closer fellowship with the Lord. They revive our souls and they draw us to a deeper level of commitment to following Christ. I believe that's what Jesus was asking Martha to do. I know you believe in me, but are you trusting me? Are you trusting me about your brother who's in a tomb right now? Are you hearing the words that I'm saying? Because I'm about to show you something that you've never seen before. That brings us to verse 28. When she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher, is <clears throat> the teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. When Martha received news that Jesus had come to town, she rose quickly and went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. When Martha calls Mary, now Mary rises quickly to go meet Jesus. We don't really know why Mary stayed in the house. Some interpreters think it's a, it's a personality thing. You know, Martha is the go-getter. She's the type A personality. Mary, remember, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus while Martha was preparing a meal. I don't know about that. But there is strong evidence to suggest that Martha was the owner of the house and that Lazarus and Mary were her younger siblings and so they lived with her. And so Martha, as the household owner, went to meet Jesus, the, the representative of the family, she went to meet Jesus, and then Mary waited until she was called for. It is interesting to note how the Jews responded now remember, there were Jews in town. There were a lot of people here comforting Mary. There were a lot of people here comforting Martha. And they were honoring Lazarus. So there were people in the house with Mary and they were mourning together. So when Mary gets up, they think that she goes to the tomb. And that makes sense. Because if you remember during this first week, basically the family would be either in the house or at the tomb. 
It was actually Mary and Martha who broke protocol because they left the house and they didn't go to the tomb. They left the house to meet Jesus. I think that emphasizes the relationship that Jesus had with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were very, very close. They were close enough for Mary and Martha to break with tradition and to go away from the house and meet Jesus while he was coming to town. That brings us to verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. When Mary comes to where Jesus is, she falls at his feet. And the verb there translated falls is the same Greek verb that elsewhere is translated to worship. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that she was falling to her knees to worship Jesus at that moment, but it does mean that she intentionally fell to her knees and that it was very much a sign of personal humility and respect for Jesus. You know, the idea that Jesus is her Lord. And so it's a very respectful greeting. But then notice what she says. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's the exact same thing Martha said. They're both incredibly distraught over their loss. Loss is a very difficult thing. And we can see how it affects Mary and Martha, both of them, because they're their very close friend who had the power to do something about it They've known him long enough to know that he heals people. They're very disappointed. Notice also Jesus' response. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. That word groaned has a lot of different meanings, but the idea is that it communicates very much being upset. For human emotion, it can even communicate anger. For animals, it refers specifically to like when a horse snorts. So it's a very interesting word picture. The idea is that deep down, something was very greatly affecting Jesus, but then it had a very physical, um, you could see it on his face, that something was troubling him. Between the death of his beloved friend, the deep sorrow expressed by Mary and Martha, in the morning of all the Jews who had come in, Jesus was very deeply affected. And this demonstrates his humanity. He feels hurt. He feels pain and anger, just like any other person. It also reveals the passionate side of his divinity. Why did he go to the cross? He went to the cross to conquer sin and to conquer death. That brings us to verse 34. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? We've already mentioned this a couple of times during the first week of burial. It was customary for friends and relatives to be mourning at the tomb. So Jesus' request to go see Lazarus makes perfect sense, and some of the Jews who were there said, come and see. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. That word wept, there's three different Greek words. This one means to shed a tear. So it's more of a silent kind of, of weeping. We already know he was deeply moved. But the important thing is that the Jews took notice. Even they noticed how much he cared for Lazarus and, and the family. This is now the third time that John has indicated how much Jesus loved Lazarus. So we know when Jesus waited two days to come, it wasn't because he didn't love the family. 
Not at all. In fact, you could say the opposite. It was because he loved them so much that he needed to communicate this idea so that they would believe in him. Ultimately, he delayed because he intended to work a miracle that would cause many people to trust in Jesus. That concludes scene two and brings us to scene three, which is Jesus at Lazarus' tomb. Verse 38, Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? The tomb was a cave with a stone lying against it. In first century Israel, both natural and carved caves were very common. Some tombs had vertical entrances, and so they would have been cut out of the rock, and then the person would have been lowered in via rope. Other caves had a more horizontal where you could just walk in, and then some had st stairs carved so you could walk down into the tomb. Later, when Lazarus walks out, it was definitely a more horizontal cave. I don't think he just floated up out of the tomb. I don't think that's what happened. The stone was important because it served two purposes. One, it, pre it protected the body from wild animals. Two, it provided a barrier from the odor of decomposition. One of the important issues we need to understand here is, is about this odor. The Jews did not embalm the deceased the same way the Egyptians did. And that's a hotly debated issue in scholarly circles. The Jews did not prepare the internal organs in any way. What they did is they washed the body, they wrapped the body in linens and spices, and then they laid it to rest in the tomb. And ultimately, they wanted the body to decompose because they had what's called a second burial where a year later they collected the bones of the deceased in a special urn and set it in a special place in the tomb. So Martha's actually being very practical when she says there's going to be an odor. And the King James captures the Greek well, he stinketh. That's, that's what it says. It's four days into the decomposition process. Spices aren't going to cover that now. But Jesus is saying, Martha, I want you to trust me. I don't want you to be practical right now. I want you to trust me. He says to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? There's that purpose statement again. You will see the glory of God. So Jesus asked Martha to roll away the stone. He wanted Martha and everyone present to believe in him. You know, sometimes the Lord instructs us to take actions that make little sense to human rationale. Some people are risk takers, and maybe uh, those kinds of invitations are very easy for them. I don't know. I know for me, I'm not a risk taker, and those kinds of invitations from the Lord are very difficult. They're difficult to discern, and they're difficult to follow. When we moved to California, I quit my job teaching, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I wrestled with it for about three months. I have really wanted to serve in the church for several years. And I knew there was a seminary down the road, but I, I was like, well, what if I don't get in? What if I don't do well? What if that's not what I'm supposed to do? How are we going to pay for this? All those things that came up in my mind, you know, the, the practical side. But I just really felt this tugging in my heart. Well, apply and see what happens. So I moved to California. Instead of getting licensed as a teacher, then I went and uh, I applied to seminary and I got accepted and I started classes. Uh, of course, it took a lot of prayer and then some conversations with my wife. Um, but seminary wasn't in the budget two years ago. It's really still not in the budget, but the Lord has provided. It doesn't always work out that way, and that's usually because I probably heard wrong, 
where I was confused, like the disciples, like Martha. But in this case, I know seminary worked out for me so far because it was a step of faith that God called me to, but to follow Him in that. That brings us to verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you have always heard me because of the people who are standing by. I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. I have in my notes this is the third time, but I think it's the fourth time that Jesus has stated a purpose in coming to Bethany. He's got two purposes. One is to glorify God and glorify the Son. And the second is that people will believe in Him that He is the Son. And so it really all goes together. Glorify the Son and believe that He is the Son. Even that prayer, I think it was audible. I think it was intended for people to hear, not to draw attention to Himself, but, to, but, but sort of a, an indirect way of saying, something's about to happen. You should be paying attention to this. Because there's just a crowd of people and they're all mourning. Jesus is directing their attention to say, are you ready to see what's going to happen? That brings us to verse 43. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Here's a different Greek word for cry. This is to cry out with a loud voice. It can be to cry out in pain out in sorrow. Here he's crying out to call. And he calls Lazarus. And I can just imagine the, the people who were gathered there looking into the tomb where the stone has just been rolled away. And then Jesus cries out in a loud voice to the deceased, Lazarus, come forth. And for a split second before anything happens, you're probably thinking, this guy's crazy. But then all of a sudden, the dead man comes forth. How about that? This guy's not crazy. This guy just raised him back to life. It's interesting. He came out still wrapped, which is why he needed to be loosed or unbound. You know, there's some, some parallels and there's also some contrasts with Lazarus' resurrection and Jesus' resurrection. One example is that with Lazarus' resurrection, the people had to roll the stone away. With Jesus' resurrection, nobody had to roll the stone away. With Lazarus' resurrection, he came out still all wrapped from his burial. But Jesus wasn't wrapped. In fact, the grave clothes were folded, lying in the tomb. Those are just interesting. I think they do illustrate that Lazarus' resurrection was a physical resurrection. He came back to his human life, to die again. But Christ's resurrection was superior because he came back to life never to die again. He came back to life in his glorified body. There were a lot of people gathered. The disciples were there. Mary and Martha were there. The Jews who had come from Jerusalem to comfort Mary and Martha, to mourn over Lazarus, they were there. Some of these probably already believed in Jesus. We're talking the disciples, Mary and Martha. They already believed at least somewhat, even if they misunderstood some things. And then a lot of the Jews, these weren't Jewish leaders. These were just people, just normal, everyday, common people. And so they were curious. We have a chance to see this Jesus whom everyone is talking about, saying that he does all these miracles. Let's go see. Well, now they've seen. They saw him bring a dead man to life. And it brought them to a moment of decision. Did they believe? Did they not believe? John tells us about two different kinds of people. Some of them, seeing the things that Jesus did, did believe in Him. They believed that He was the Christ, the Son of God. 
just as Martha confessed. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things he did. Now I asked myself, the ones who went to the Pharisees, did they believe or not? Well, the text doesn't say. I do know this. In the Greek, there's a very stark contrast between the ones who believe and the ones who went to the Pharisees. That says to me at least some of the ones who went to the Pharisees were, went unbelieving. Jesus raised a dead man to life in the presence of his disciples, Mary and Martha, and many Jews. The resurrection of Lazarus is the last of seven miraculous signs in the Gospel of John, and the purpose is very clear. To glorify the Father, and thereby glorify the Son, demonstrating that Jesus is the Son, that Jesus is the Christ. It also foreshadows the rest of the book. It foreshadows the death and the crucifixion, but it also foreshadows the resurrection of Christ. Jesus went to Bethany with a purpose, not to heal a sick man, but to bring a dead man back to life. Jesus, the Christ, is the Son of God. He is the resurrection and the life. He exercises authority over life himself and promises eternal life to all who believe in his name. So for us here, have you never believed? I invite you to believe this evening and thereby have eternal life. Have you already believed? I invite you to reaffirm that belief and listen to his voice and try to discern if he is inviting you to trust him. He is inviting you to trust him, but how he may be doing that in your life right now. I do have a couple of discussion questions. Uh, let me pray and then we'll have those. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together and for the narrative in John 11. We thank you for this miracle that Jesus performed, raising Lazarus from death to life. How that is both a, an image of the spiritual reality of our death in sin and when we believe in you, how we have eternal life. Also, how it's a picture of the physical reality that one day when you return, you will give us new bodies. And Heavenly Father, I pray that as we're gathered together, as we discuss these questions, as I, and as we go from this place, that you'll help us to reflect on these ideas, to, to reflect on ways that you don't fit into our box of expectations, but maybe you're calling us to trust you in a particular area of our lives. Help us to see what that is, how we might do that, according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.